Tired of your slow and glitchy queue system? Always waiting for it to load? This is so frustrating. Why is it so slow? Sounds like you need Q 2.5. It's lightning fast. Every app responds quickly with new functionality and even factory navigation is a breeze. Wait, there's more. If you call right now, you can get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. It's the best. Don't be this guy. Call now. 1844 Fast Q. Don't call this number. Only $99.99 plus $39.99 shipping and handling. This isn't a real price. Just check with your dealer. Brought to you by Jet Fuel Only Channel. <laughs> now, if that guy represents you in any way, you need to upgrade your Q system. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm here with another how to for your Cadillac. Today, I'm going to be talking about how you can upgrade your Cadillac's slow and glitchy Q system to a faster, smooth system similar to what they put in the 2016-2017 Cadillacs. That's right, if you have this type of Q screen and your car is around 2013 to early 2016, you probably are eligible for some type of upgrade. And once you've done this upgrade, you'll actually love your infotainment system again. Now I know what you're thinking, Daniel, I'm over my slow glitchy Q system. I've got everything I need right in my phone. And you know what, I totally get it, you're right. All of our music is generally stored on our phones now, or we have all of our music streaming apps, or we have the best maps, we have the messaging apps that we like, and of course, our Google Assistant or Siri. But if you're anything like me, I'm kind of OCD, and I like the clean cockpit concept. As in, I want it to feel like I just got into my car for the first time off the showroom floor. It's clean, there's no clutter, there's no wires running around, there's no phone mounted on the windshield blocking some of my view, there's not a phone mounted on the vent blocking my vent. I don't even like it when the cup holder is open. I close that little cover when there's no cups in there because it looks cleaner. No fuzzy dice for me. And with the new Q upgrade, as well as Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, you're gonna get most of the good functionality that you expect from your phone, and it's all up on that big eight inch Q screen. You just get in your car, plug in your phone, tuck it away into the center console or behind the HVAC controls, and everything is right there on the screen. You don't see any wires, no mounts, nothing. It's a beautiful thing, I'm telling you. So in this video, I'm gonna tell you how the upgrade works, where you can get it, and of course, how much it costs. Then I'm gonna give you one of the most detailed installations of how to install it in a Cadillac CTS. Now, I, if you don't have a CTS, don't worry. At least the video is gonna give you a good idea of what's involved when you do this upgrade. Anyone can do it as long as you have the right tools and a little bit of time. The installations are pretty similar across models, but sometimes things are in a different location. So your parts retailer will give you more detailed instructions and there's probably some other YouTube videos. So you're probably thinking, okay, I gotta upgrade Q. That means I gotta replace that thing in the dashboard, right? That screen and all that. Actually, no, that's just sort of like a computer monitor and touchscreen interface. You see the real brains of the Q system is in what's called the HMI module. And that's somewhere behind the dash. In the CTS, it's underneath the glove box. We're gonna replace that with the new 2.5 model because the slow one is the 2.0. We also need to upgrade the radio module in the CTS to make all this work. And we will upgrade the USB port in the center console to give you faster charging to keep up with your phone while it's doing Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. Now you need to understand that this is not an official GM upgrade. For some reason, Cadillac didn't want us to have this upgrade in our older Cadillacs. But some smart people did figure out that you can put newer parts in the car and program them to the VIN number and they can make it work. Now you're probably thinking, crap, is this gonna void my warranty? Well, technically no. Just because you replace some parts in your car does not mean your whole car's warranty is void. You see, there's laws against that. So if you install this, Cadillac can really only void warranty for anything that was affected by your install. And don't worry that most of these components are very stable. They're gonna last a long time. But in case anything does go wrong with Q, be sure to talk to your parts retailer before taking your car to the dealer because you don't want the dealer messing up your very expensive 2.5 upgrade. Now, generally there shouldn't be any maintenance done for your Q system, but I do know that those Q screens tend to break. And when they replace that, they won't even know that you've upgraded your system. They don't even need to mess with it. So don't worry, if your Q screen breaks, it won't be a problem. All right, so where do you get this upgrade? Well, there's a number of places you can get it. Remember, this isn't a dealer upgrade, so you can't go to the dealer. But there is a company called gmpartshouse.com and they're a GM parts supplier and they figured out a way to make these parts work in your older Cadillac. 
I chose gmpartshouse.com because they're a reputable GM parts dealer and uh, they're good guys over there. They'll help you sort out exactly what you need for your car and all the parts are new. There's another company called MVI and they do a system as well. They also have some other upgrades that are a little cheaper if you like. Um, they have a setup that can do phone mirroring so your phone screen can be projected on to the Q screen. The downside is you can't really control your phone on the Q screen. They also have uh, options for additional cameras on your car and things like that. Another website is infotainment.com. I don't know much about them, but they do the Q upgrade. There are some retailers on eBay that do it, but some of them use used parts. Uh, but I know of at least one person that's used an eBay retailer and had great success. Another thing you can do is maybe dig around on the Facebook groups, especially the vSport groups. There's a couple of people there with uh, the know-how and the tools and they could do it for you with your own supplied parts. Uh, I did hear that sometimes though you could lose the guidelines on your reverse camera or the cross traffic alerts, uh, but it's been debatable. I don't know if it always happens. I went with GM Parts House and uh, my backup lines work and my cross traffic alerts work as well. So I'm pretty happy with that. But it is almost twice as much as going through some individual to program your modules. Now I'll provide all the links in the description below so you can uh, visit those websites and shop around for yourself. So this upgrade is going to cost around $500 to $1,000 depending on your source and the options you need for your specific model and year. Now when you go to the website for GM Parts House, it can be a little confusing on their menus, so it's best to just call up the retailer and talk to them about exactly what you need and get a quote. Now, I've already told you that the new Q is faster and smoother. Not only is that, but you get some new features uh, as well as some upgraded graphics. One of the new features I really like is if you are connected just to Bluetooth, you now have access to browsing your music library right there on the screen while connected to Bluetooth. Previously, you could only do that if your phone was plugged in. They also added a new function where you can directly tune the radio station you want, like a little keypad. And I don't know, it's not something I would use, but it's kind of neat. Say a command or say hi. The voice control in the car actually works a little better. It's a little faster in responding to you and recognizes your voice a little better. I mean, it's no Siri, but it's almost usable. Now the maps are really where the graphics have changed and it's way faster and smoother. Once I've picked an address, it loads up about as fast as Google Maps. It's great. And that's really useful when your Google Maps from your phone isn't working because you don't have cell signal because the car's mapping system will always work for you. Plus, when you do this upgrade, you're gonna get the latest map database. That's already worth about $100. Also, if you didn't have factory navigation before, this upgrade can allow you to add factory navigation. You just add a GPS antenna splitter that comes off of your OnStar system, and then the HMI module has navigation built in. There you go. But I'm not sure that's a real concern for you because you're gonna have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto where you have Google Maps with satellite view and Waze with all of its police warnings and whatnot. It's really great. Now there are a couple downsides to this upgrade, I have to admit. One of the things is it is a wired connection. Only the latest and greatest models of cars out there are just starting to get the new wireless Apple CarPlay. That's really neat, but sorry, there's no upgrade for that coming. They've also removed one of the features called Time Shift. That was where you could uh, record live radio and you could pause it and rewind it if you need to, but I guess they uh, assume that a lot of people don't really need that. Also, if you have rear climate controls like I have on my CTS, I used to be able to control those through Q, but now that's no longer available. But it's no big deal because the passengers in the back can control it from the module in the back seat. Also, when you plug in Apple CarPlay, it does disable Bluetooth. And when you press and hold the voice button on the steering wheel to conjure up Siri, well, that required a Bluetooth connection. So you won't be able to do that anymore, but it's no big deal. You just say, hey Siri, or press the home button on the Q screen to pull up Siri. Now I did hear that uh, some Android phones actually still work though. Lastly, all you can get is 2.5. There is a 3.0 out there, but it's just not available for upgrading our cars, sorry. Now onto the installation. I'm gonna do one of the most detailed installations on YouTube so that there aren't any steps that you really have to question. And you're gonna see that with just the right tools and a little bit of time, you can knock it out no problem. I promise, just follow through and take a look. But if you do decide that it's not for you, you can always take the parts and my video to a car stereo installer and I'm sure they can knock it out in like an hour or two. Installing complex car stereos is way harder than installing this Q upgrade, I promise. Also, don't take it to the dealer. Like I said, this isn't an official upgrade, so the dealer usually doesn't want to mess with it unless you know somebody over there. 
Otherwise, let's get to the how-to video and see how it's done. Here's a quick overview of the installation. We're going to remove a few panels from the passenger side. Then we're going to remove the decorative trim. Under the dashboard, there are three screws we'll remove. Then we'll remove some connectors under there, which will allow us to get to another screw. We'll lower the tray under the glove box to get the HMI module out. Then we'll move the passenger knee airbag out of the way so we have more room. We'll replace the HMI module with the new one. Then we'll remove the glove box and replace the radio module. Once it's all plugged in, we'll test the system out and it should work great. For this installation, you'll need the following tools. I always recommend a light so you can see in dark areas. You'll need a Phillips head screwdriver, as well as a plastic trim removal tool. You can find these at Harbor Freight and Amazon. Needle nose pliers, a socket driver and a ratchet wrench, an extension or two, seven millimeter sockets, deep and shallow, as well as a 10 millimeter socket. I also recommend some gloves because you'll be reaching into some tight areas and there are plastic areas that can scratch you. First, we're gonna remove some panels in the passenger area. Use your trim tool to remove this panel. It just pops loose, there's a couple of metal clips in there, and then just get it out of the way so you can access this Phillips head screw. You have to remove this screw so that you can take off the next panel. Now remove this panel. It just pops right off and slides back towards the seat. Open the glove box so you have some more access to this area. Slide your trim removal tool into a crack here and this panel pops off. It has a number of brass clips on it. Now we're gonna remove the trim panel on my car. It's the carbon fiber. There are two seven millimeter screws here to remove. Once you remove those, you'll need to lift the plastic over this tab here. So just pull it out towards the door and then pull towards you. It pops right out, again, more metal clips. Now go to the trunk and disconnect the battery. We do this because we're going to be working around a live airbag. Use a 10 millimeter socket to loosen the nut on the cable. Pull the cable from the terminal. Protect the terminal with some cardboard. You don't want the cable reconnecting with the terminal or any other metal part of the car, otherwise it will re-electrify the vehicle. Now go back to your passenger compartment. We'll remove a seven millimeter screw on the right side. Also another seven millimeter screw on the left side. Next, remove this panel on the right side. Don't use this tab here. You wanna use this tab. It comes right down, and this is where the HVAC connectors are. Once this is out of the way, you have access to another seven millimeter screw. Go ahead and remove that. Once that screw is out, go ahead and disconnect all these connectors. They're just like internet cables. Press the tab and pull them out. Don't worry, they only go back in the respective holes. Now there's one more seven millimeter screw way in the back. Now I had a hard time getting to this and I only was able to loosen it up a little bit. If that's all you can do, don't worry. You might not even need to mess with it. Now you can lower the HMI tray. Press towards the front of the vehicle and lower the tray. It's just kind of hanging up in there with a lip. This is where the HMI module is right here. Let's remove this old technology so we can put in our new stuff. It just comes out from its clips, slides out, and then you just remove all the plugs attached to the back. Again, they're all specific to their holes, so don't worry about getting them mixed up later. Next, we need to remove the passenger knee airbag. It's held on with two 10 millimeter nuts. Grab a deep 10 millimeter socket and remove the nut from the right side.
Then go ahead and remove the nut from the left side. But as you do, you'll notice the airbag wants to start to fall. So hold it carefully. It is attached with a cord still. Don't disconnect the airbag. I hear that there's always a possibility of like check engine lights or whatnot. Plus, we just want to minimize touching this airbag. Kind of put it in a safe location. Now, take your new HMI module, make sure the silver is on top. Plug in all your cables once again. If you didn't have factory navigation before, this is where you'd install a GPS splitter and then plug that into the HMI module. Now, when I put it back in its clips, I did break one of the clips off and I had to glue it back. I glued it, but it didn't really stay, but there's no vibration or anything under there, so it's working out. So if you break one, don't fret too much. Now you can see the posts that the 10 millimeter airbag nuts were on. Yeah, those posts are holding the lower part of the glove box. You'll want to remove a screw that's right here. It was a seven millimeter screw and I didn't show it. Now you'll need to reconnect the battery. We do this because we need to open the glove box. Once you've done that, go ahead and disconnect the battery and make the cable safe again. Now that the glove box is open, we have access to more seven millimeter screws. We're gonna remove these so we can remove the glove box to access the radio module. There's one here on the left, one at the top left, another. There's this screw holding in where the CD player would normally be installed, and then two more on the right. First, let's tackle this screw. I don't know why, but I had a little trouble with this. When you screw on it, it doesn't want to back out. It's sort of a plastic screw. So what I did here was I pressed the screw from the top while unscrewing it at the bottom, and this helped it back out. Once you get the screw out, you want to pull out the little clip. I used some uh, needle nose pliers to break the clip so it would come out easier. You don't need to replace this later. It's not really holding anything very secure anyway. If you can get it out without breaking it, more power to you. Now on to the other seven millimeter screws. There's one here. And then four more across the top. Now be aware, the glove box will start to fall. It's kind of hanging on by this little lip right here. Yeah, that's about it. And the glove box is heavy, so be careful and be ready to catch it. Take the lip off of that ledge and then lower down the glove box. It's still kind of hanging on by a bunch of wires. So if you want to take the stress off those wires and get a little more room, you'll need to loosen those up. Loosen what you think you need. Here I pulled this wire loom attachment. And I think what really helped a lot was using my needle nose pliers to release this clip here. If you take out the CD player box or where the CD player used to be, you'll be able to get a little better access there. I also unplugged this plug. I believe it was a light. This gave me a lot more room to work. Now we can remove the radio module. It's in with these two clips. Notice I'm loosening them up, taking the tension off the top and the bottom, and then it moves slightly left away from the clips and then slides towards you. You may have to wrestle with it just a little bit, but try not to break those clips. Once you get access, go ahead and pull the plugs in the back. I believe there's five of them there. And again, you can't mix them up later. They only go into certain holes and they're color coded. Now we're ready to install our new radial module. Just reverse the procedure. Put the plugs back into the back of the radial module. Again, they're all color coded and designed only to go into certain holes. I admit, this is probably the hardest part of all the installation is trying to get into position so you can plug these back in. Once you have them all plugged in again, put the radial module back in its clipped holder. Slide the back end of it towards the front right of the car, and then slide it to the right side slightly so it can clip back in. 
Now before we put everything back together, we need to test out the system. So reconnect your battery so you have power for your car. Start your car, and you'll see that the cue screen comes up with the Cadillac script. I fast forwarded and now we can see that there is a projection icon saying that we do have the new HMI installed. Now the car will also require you to uh, reprogram the memory switches on the windows. You'll see instructions on your dashboard. Just follow the instructions. It makes you roll down and up the windows so that they can be reprogrammed for their positions. Now go through and check out your new features. You will notice that the compass doesn't quite show the direction yet. It takes a little while for the uh, compass to align. Notice that there's uh, no rear climate controls. Then go ahead and plug in your phone and approve it to use Apple CarPlay or Android Auto and uh, go to your phone and also allow it. On the Q screen, go ahead and hit that projection button. It will eventually turn into the Android Auto or Apple CarPlay logo. And there it is, working just like it should. You'll see that it disconnects Bluetooth every time you connect to Apple CarPlay. Confirm all your apps are there and you can customize those later. Alright, now that we've confirmed everything's working, it's time to put everything back together. Reattach the plugs and wire looms that you removed on the glove box. Once you got those taken care of, raise the glove box and hook it back on that lip. Also make sure on the bottom of the glove box that the holes do go around those posts where the 10 millimeter nuts go. Slide the extra shelf back in. By the way, if you do have a CD player, I can't tell you much about how that's connected, but I'm sure you'll figure it out. Again, I didn't put that little screw back in. It makes it easier to change the cabin air filter later anyway. Now put your 7mm screws back in across the top of the glove box. And don't forget the one on the far left. Now put your decorative trim back on. It just snaps back into place with those metal clips. Don't be afraid to give it a little tap with your hand to make it snap. Remember, there were two 7mm screws holding that in on the side. Now you can go ahead and close the glove box so we have access underneath. Don't forget to put the 7mm screw in the center underneath the glove box back in. Now we're going to disconnect the battery again because we're going to be handling the airbag again. Go ahead and reinstall the knee airbag. It just slips around those posts where the 10 millimeter nuts go. It's a little awkward, but just hold it up there and then get one of the nuts started to hold it in place. Once you get both of them on, torque them down and then you can reconnect your battery for the last time. Don't forget to tighten the nut holding the battery cable to the terminal. Now reinstall the tray holding the HMI module. You just kind of got to press it towards the front of the car and get that lip up and behind the airbag. Once it's up there, it's pretty secure, but we need to put our screws back in. Don't forget the one hiding way up inside. Then go ahead and plug in those connectors again. Now it is recommended that while your battery is connected to plug in the brown one last. Plug in the brown one last, otherwise you might get some error codes. If your battery is disconnected, it shouldn't matter. Next, install the screws on the right side, the back, and the left side under the glove box. Lastly, you'll want to replace the two trim panels near the center console. Be sure to put your screw back in and then clip the side panel back into place. And just like that, you're done. Be sure to clean up afterward. You probably got fingerprints on things and a clean car is a happy car.
Well, we've done it. We've installed our new Q upgrade in the Cadillac CTS. As you can see, it just takes a little time and some basic tools, but once it's in, it just works. It's really great. Now I know Apple CarPlay and Android Auto leaves some functions to be desired, but hopefully they'll improve the functionality in the future. But for now, you've got great maps, great messaging, great music streaming, and even your car's manual right there on the screen. I think it's pretty neat. Also, when you have to use good old Q system, it's not gonna frustrate you anymore. So if this video helped you decide if this upgrade is right for you, please hit the like button. And if you wanna see more videos of how-tos for your Cadillac, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. There is one more video you need to watch. It's the second part to this one. That's right, there's one more step where we upgrade the USB port in the center console. And this gives your phone faster charging and helps keep it charged while using Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. I'd like to know what features you think Apple CarPlay and Android Auto should have. Let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, thanks for watching another how-to here on the Jet Fuel Only channel. We'll see you next time. When you do this upgrade, you're gonna get Android CarPlay and an Auto. With this upgrade, you're gonna get Android CarPlay and Apple Auto. That's not right. I don't like my phone up in my face. I don't want it up in my business. No, sh